Hello, everybody. If you are just tuning in, feel free to use the chat function on the side, at the bottom of the screen to tell us where you're listening from tonight. Um, and make sure you select the all panelists and attendees setting um, so that everybody can see your message if you'd like. Welcome, everyone. We're just gonna give it a few more minutes as folks start to log in. Uh, my name is Megna. I am a staff member here at Book Larder in Seattle. We're located in the Fremont neighborhood. Um, and we are a small community cookbook shop here. Uh, we have been very lucky over the past year um, with COVID, um, you know, shutting down a great deal of events and, um, and stores and restaurants too. Uh, continue to be open and also um, host virtual events. Uh, one of the great upsides of that is obviously we're able to welcome in guests from all over the world, all, all over the country. Um, so, so thank you for tuning in and joining us from wherever you are today. Um, today's event, we will be um, talking about this beautiful new book, The Contented Vegan by Peggy Brousseau, um, who has graciously agreed to join us today. Um, she will be joined by, uh, in conversation by her friend um, and actress, martial artist, and stunt woman, Spice Williams Crosby. Um, we are going to be speaking for about 30 to 45 minutes, um, just Peggy and Spice. And then at about um, 1045 Pacific time, we will transition to a Q&A. So, if you have any questions for either of them, please do drop them into the Q&A button at the very bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll come back on at about 10.45 and we will um, take as many questions as we can get to. Oh, well, hello, Karen from Oakton, Virginia. See folks tuning in. Hi from Chicago. Hey, Haley. Um, all right, so we're just gonna get started. I'm gonna read um, Peggy's bio. Uh, welcome Peggy. Peggy Brousseau arrived in London in 1974 with $200 and a guitar. That first summer she worked on an archeological dig unearthing several hundred broken pipe stems and a medieval urinal. After a further period of travel, she established a small holding with orchards and a huge herb garden in a remote corner of the UK. There she acquired her fascination for the plant world and also learned to turn wood, drive a tractor and use a backhoe. Later, she moved to London with her husband. Um, she's a mother of two wonderful vegan sons. Um, Peggy says, I have been through every pre-vegan style of eating and thinking and have faced most of the hurdles to achieving a healthy plant-based diet. She has been a vegan for more than 30 years and is author or co-author of more than 24 published books, including this one. Um, and uh, welcome to Spice Williams Crosby, who will be joining Peggy in conversation. Uh, Pe Spice is a accomplished actress, stunt woman, martial artist, and doctor. She has two master's degrees, one in fitness science and the other in holistic nutrition, along with a PhD in natural health sciences. As a martial artist, she holds three black belts. Um, and she was also the first vegan bodybuilder to squat 315 pounds and bench 235 pounds, drug and animal free. Uh, she and her husband, Gregory Crosby, created their own vegan company, Spice of Life, Meatless Meats and Jerky in 1992. And in 2001, it took seven long years of working diligently, but Spice was successful in getting the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences to recognize stunt, stunt people for their contributions to the entertainment business. Because of her, the stunt community is now recognized at the prestigious Emmy Awards every year. And she also created her own company in 2010, I Fight For My Life, teaching self-protection to everyday men and women. Gregory and Spice have one beautiful son, Luke G. Crosby. Um, so welcome, Spice and Peggy. I would love to have you both come back on screen. If you'd like to support this author talk, um, you can purchase a copy of The Contented Vegan at booklarder.com. I'll put a link in the chat and um, welcome to Peggy and Spice. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Did you unmute Peggy? There we go. Ah, there you are. There we go. <laughs> 
a mute button could be dangerous. I think it my is. husband. I think my husband would like to use it every day. <laughs> Spice, that list is such a long list. I mean, most people wouldn't do that in five lifetimes. All of the things you've accomplished. It's um, amazing. I'm, just, I'm ADD, so you know, <laughs> yeah. I, start, I get anxious to start something new. Um, yeah. My biggest problem is I don't like to let go of anything I start. Yeah. So. Do you ever sleep? Um, yeah, occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of people um, talk to me about when they first transition or begin to transition to a vegan diet, they they feel a loss of energy. And I know that you've been vegan for longer than I have. 40 years, is it? Yes, ma'am. Um, have you ever suffered from that in the early days when you were transitioning? Did you suffer from a loss of energy? Because you certainly don't indicate it now. No, um, no, I never did because I came from a background uh, in medicine and also studied um, a lot about digestion, uh, food combining, yeah. and uh, how foods are digested and how the body accepts certain foods. And so there is a science actually to eating. Uh, even if you are a meat eater or a pescatarian, whatever, people have a tendency to miscombine foods. They, the sugar, the, all the other things that they combine, the dairy, those are the things that do interrupt the body from using the food for energy. And I think that just, I mean, you could say I'm a vegan and just eat Oreo cookies. Um, you have yeah, I, call, I call that a white bread and jam. Oh, okay. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Yes. In yeah. the book that um, I, I lectured many years on being a smart vegan and understanding how many grams of carbohydrates you can use and learn how to use them, not abuse them. How many grams of protein you need? Um, the rule of thumb is usually a half a gram per body pound, unless you're bodybuilding that increases a little, but how, uh, how to use your foods instead of abusing them. So there is a science. And when you just start transitioning into veganism, a lot of rules and regulations come to be a healthy vegan. So it's not just an elimination. And I think- Yeah, some yeah I, people... I agree with that. I, um, I've, I'm not as, uh, as scientific as you are in, in, the, in that I haven't studied it in that particular way. Um, but I, I think that there, it's much more than just saying no to animal based yes. products. Um, I absolutely. But I've taken a very, very, uh, a very different approach from the one that you began with. And I've, I've worked to make it very simple and easy so, um, so that people don't have to worry in the initial stages about counting and measuring. And I understand that you came from a, a medical background and so forth. I did not, and that would have done my head in. <laughs> yeah. it, it would have at that time. Now I, I can see it, it's quite fascinating, actually. Um, but for me, um, I, my whole reason for writing The Contented Vegan was to invite people into the plant-based way of eating. And to I think a lot of people have it as a natural kind of um, uh, curiosity. And they, they want to try it, but they're, they're, they don't know how. And they might think, well, I don't want to be a vegan like those skinny little runts I see on, you know, in those funny t-shirts. So they have a, this pre preconception perhaps that they don't want to be that sort of person or that they aren't that sort of person, but they do want to try a, a healthier diet, a more plant-based diet. And so my whole motive was to invite them and say, this is how you can start. It's very simple, it's very easy, but it's not just saying no to animal-based products. And yes. I think that- yeah, Well, I it, totally agree with you. And yes, I did come in uh, in 1977, September 19th. I hit my knees and asked God to help me turn my life around from drugs and alcohol. And I realized the first thing I had to do was detox and clean out. And as I started learning about how the food breaks down and digests in the body, and then little by little, 
I had no idea I was transitioning. I was at a party. Oh, okay, I, yes. I was at a banquet or some, there was food everywhere, a Christmas party. And the guy said, well, try the salmon. I said, oh, I don't eat salmon. Try the eggs. I don't eat eggs. Try the ramaki. I said, I don't eat that. He goes, what are you, a gosh darn vegetarian? And he goes, how about the cheese? And I said, yeah, I don't eat cheese anymore. And he goes, what are you, a vegan? I thought he was calling me a name. I went home to look it up. It wasn't even in the dictionary. Yeah. And I'm like, then I started getting calls from Vegetarian Magazine and all these people saying, you, we, you're an actress, you're a bodybuilder, you're a vegan. I said, oh, I'm a what? <laughs> so I, I didn't know it, but you are absolutely correct. The reason why some people transition a lot of them are very spiritual, emotional, the animals, everything. My transition was to trying to get my health together mm. and, and trying to detox, clean out and, and learn how the body should digest and live. And then little by little, I became more spiritually connected to it. And so my evolution is where like you became so involved with the environment and, and, and the love of everything. So you've evolved from that. It doesn't matter. There are many paths. They're all connected, aren't they? Yes. They all bump into each other eventually, I think, and for whatever reason. And I think you're right. There are about four, four standard reasons why people begin to, to take this, make these changes. And health is one. The en environment is definitely one. And that's an mm -hmm increasing importance at the moment. Um, the, the natural progression from vegetarianism as well, that, that for some people, and I went through this myself, where um, suddenly the dairy just became unpalatable to me. Mm -hmm. And also I, I saw that it was very, very, very much affiliated with um, the meat industry, that they were interconnected big time, and that basically dairy sponsored meat industry so it didn't make sense yes to, well, to not eat meat and uh, then they, the the, yeah. the other one of course is the other reason is um for the animals yeah so, the spiritual understanding yeah. pain yes. i um i actually spent two years doing voluntary autopsies at the coroner's office oh my and god <laughs> who would do that it, yes. you know it's a dying business but anyway uh. um I would see as we would, you know, cut the intestines open, I would see the undigested and rotted putrefied dairy, cheese, milk, everything, oh. along with the sugar in there, it's giving you systemic candida albicans that bores holes through 60,000 miles of vessels. And then of course, you've got the antibiotics, the amount of pus coming from the cows, mastitis in their nipples. So a lot of the dairy was the dairy was the first thing I actually gave up because yeah. I started getting educated. And um, you know what they say, educated people make educated decisions. That's true. And so <laughs> the education on the dairy and the um, just the elimination for me, I was just reading, oh, it takes 12, first of all, you don't digest dairy, so it takes 12 hours to get it out of your system. Oh, all right, so I don't wanna eat that anymore. And then the red meat, 49 carcinogenic chemicals and it can rot and putrefy, and then it's already dead before it gets to you. Oh, okay, and it yeah. takes how long to digest? Nine to 10 hours. Oh, I don't wanna do that. Little by little, through certain educated points, that's how suddenly somebody called me a vegan. Well, yeah. I think in those days, 1979, I think it was, it was vegan, vegan, vegan. You know, you say tomato, I say tomato, but yes. they yes. would call me a vegan. I'm like, yes. what is that? But it's, it's from the, from the star system, Vega. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, um, I took a, a very different route into it all and basically Having made the shift, um, I, I and then becoming pregnant, actually realizing that I had to make a further decision: Do I want to, with my husband, who's because when we met, we were both vegetarian, and we became vegan together, and that was we were very fortunate, both of us, wow. to experience that. But then to to know that there's a child on the way, um, we had to make a decision: Do we raise 
that child in a vegan on a vegan diet because that's what our family unit has created or do we try and let them decide later and we were given a lot of guidance to say you must let them decide later it's too weird um, but we didn't we we followed through on our our decision to eat a vegan diet and sure enough as we we learned about the, the health benefits and the nutrition we because we took it very seriously and tried to self-educate um, as far as the things that you've begun to describe and really um, the the plant-based diet is now considered to be a primordial prevention that is that it it prevents problems from occurring before there's even any risk of them. So if you, if you raise a child on a vegan diet and you do it carefully, you are preventing the onset of diseases that are chronic and epidemic in our culture. And these diseases start in childhood, coronary heart disease, arterial heart disease uh, Absolutely. starts in childhood, Absolutely. as does propensity for um, type two diabetes, Absolutely. as does osteoporosis. The, the basis of, of these things are laid down in childhood and a plant-based diet, as I say, is now thought to provide primordial protection against those. And so we've, we feel very, uh, very, very glad, very happy that what we've done is provide that baseline for our sons. And I know you have as well. Well, um, as you have a magnificent husband and you both came together and talked about it in, a, in an open mind. And my husband's been a vegan now for 30 years. So um, it wasn't too hard for him to transition because I'm the cook in the family. Yes. <laughs> yes. The man would starve to death if I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he just, he said, good food is good food. If it tastes good, I'll eat it, whatever you put in front of me. That's and, lovely. Now, yeah. and now it, that's, it's part of our faith. But the interesting thing as a doctor, I, which I've been seeing patients for many, many, many years, I get the ones that are sent home to die. They don't want to do chemo. They do want to do chemo, but they want to protect themselves. They yeah. go through hep C, HIV, AIDS, um, can, all kinds of things that I have to determine and discuss with them. You have a hormonally dri driven cancer. I really believe we should go vegan. I'm not here to morally, spiritually, ethically tell anybody what to do. The real Latin term for doctor is docir, which means educator. Yes. So I educate them and they start to make up their mind as, okay, well, I can do this for three months, six months, maybe a year. I am so fortunate. One of my last patients uh, had stage four cancer and she went totally vegan. She also did some other um, applied therapies, but she is now in total remission and she wants to stay vegan. Yes. So that's it, the thing. It's a it's healing. It's a healing you're right. It for me, it was like healing for these people. But what you're saying is to begin a childhood to prevent these diseases. And I'm That's sure right. I don't know about you, but I got hit with a lot, a lot of resistance. Sure. Um, you know, my child's gonna gonna die. He's not gonna thrive. Even as doctors said, I can't treat your son because uh, you know he won't he won't make his marks. I had so many people calling us uh, child abusers because we weren't mm. feeding them the in, in our world, the American diet. And um, the funny thing, I'll give you this little antidote, is that we found one doctor said, OK, I'll see your kid. But the minute he stops thriving, I'm going to have words with you. Okay. Well, he surpassed everybody. Yes. And about 10 years later, before because it was a child doctor, he moved on. He said, I just need to tell you and Gregory, my wife and I are now vegans. Fantastic, what a thing. Yes, that's great. Well, I, I, I think we went through a similar process because it was very much an unknown or a little known way of eating when, when we started as well. But the reason I was inspired to write this book is to create a toolkit so that people who were interested 
could at least experiment with the diet, hopefully hold on to it, even if it was only partially plant-based diet that they ended up with. I'm not a person who, who wants to go around and convert others either, but I do think it's an important um, diet to understand, both for health reasons and of course for the environment. And so my toolkit is quite, is, is organized and you can see this if you look at the table of contents. Yes, of the, of the book. Reading, reading the book was really exciting because of course I agreed with you on everything, <laughs> oh. but, but you did make it organized and uh, there is a, I don't wanna interrupt you, I want you to continue, but I do wanna make a certain point that there is a social um, fear yeah. of some, uh, a lot of times uh, human beings are comfortable with being labeled. Yes. I certainly am not. But um, if I, if through my Spice of Life Meatless Meats company or jerky, I would do demos and say, hey, would you like to try some of my vegan jerky? And they go, I'm not a vegan. And I say, well, do you eat a banana? Uh, that's vegan. Do you eat pasta? That's vegan. Yes. I mean, if you're eating vegan food, doesn't make you a vegan. It just allows you to, what you just said, expand your dietary choices. That's right. That's right. I begin with the 80-20 rule is what I call yes, it. And my favorite, in, my favorite. In business, you'd have heard that as the Pareto principle, I think. But it basically says that if you check carefully with over the past week or a few days, you'll find that about 80% of your diet already is likely to be plant-based. And I give the example of a burger um, that has a slab of, you know, the hamburger, mm -hmm. it, but that the bun, the salad, and uh, the pickles are plant-based. Right. It might have cheese, it might have mayo, but those things can be readily changed. You can change it the burger to a, beef, a bean burger, you can have vegan mayo and coconut cheese or something like that. And suddenly you've got a completely vegan meal that looks the same. It's, it's not an inconvenience in, in any other way. Um, and the same with like a breakfast, you can pour plant milk over your cereal rather than dairy milk. And just these simple steps where you have to work with only the 20% of your diet that is likely to be animal-based. And 80% is already probably plant-based. So I've tried to make it a very, um, you know, you can relax, relax into this. Just look at your diet as it is and decide to pick off one or two things, maybe one meal a week, maybe one type of food that you just suddenly say, I'm gonna remove that and replace it with something else. Exactly. And again, Again, I've called this swap shopping, where it's never been easier to do this, where you, you uh, like the look of your plate with a, with a, a cutlet in, in one corner. Um, you keep the vegetables, you keep um, the salads and so forth, but the cutlet, instead of being a meat-based product, is um, one of these amazing vegetable cutlets of some sort. Be exactly. It could be a bean cutlet, it could be one of the um, processed soya, cutlets there's a huge variety of products out there or if and I'm one of these people I don't really need to substitute something that looks like meat I just like to explore so I just put another type of vegetable on the plate instead and arrange it to look colorful there are a well, number I of really simple steps that you can take to just take the pressure off yourself while you gradually and comfortably move into increasing the amount of plant-based foods you have in your diet. And that is the toolkit I'm hoping to provide. Also, you mentioned um, using your food in the early days, especially spice, as a way of healing. And I've mentioned the quote from Hippocrates in a little section in the book. Yes. And he said, let food be your medicine. And he lived in the sixth century BC. Yeah. And um, he knew, well, they knew something then. He did, <laughs> yes. And it's just that when you use whole foods, I mean, in fact, the, the sort of mantra that I've included is to eat a variety of plant, of whole plant-based foods that are locally grown if possible 
and in season where you live, if possible. When you do that, you have the maximum nutrient value that you can attain from your diet because it's all maxed out in, in, in nutrients. There's very little time spent in travel. There's very, it's whole foods. There's very little processing. And if it's plant-based, you have all these amazing things called phytochemicals, which are kind of, uh, they're like the bodyguards of nutrients, I think. Yes. They, they really support and enhance the effect of plant-based nutrients. Yes, the two things that you have mentioned that I am so on board with and that I have brought up in my own nutritional counseling and everything. First of all, the 80-20%. That is a big love of my life here because it's not just uh, 80%. Um, I mean, it could be a lot of things. What you're saying, I understand to make a yeah. tra smooth transition, but you can make uh, 20% uh, animal flesh food and 80% vegetables. You could do that through a week. 80% uh, of that week, you eat a certain way, 20%, you increase something else. Yeah. There is... Um, that 80 20 fits into a lot of our life it does. work. It, I mean, it could be 80% of cleaning the house, 20% of letting it go, yes. <laughs> become a mess. Yes. But 80 20 gives you an absolute license to go, okay, all right, I'm, I'm not 100%, but I'm experimenting. And the other thing you said, whole, the whole foods. Yeah. Um, I totally believe that. Same thing with supplements. Um, when you get whole food supplements, and yes, the problem is, no matter how brilliant you eat. I'm an organic food combining vegan. All oh. my food is non-GMO, <laughs> organic. I combine all the foods to digest properly. Um, call me OCD, but um, I, li I live that way. But I'm still, uh, my PhD was called Sick Soil, Sick Plants, Sick People. Yeah. And we have done a lot of damage to our soils. So unfortunately, the best of the best foods are lacking certain minerals and supplements. You say your phytochemicals and things, they're probiotics within the soil that have to come up and support uh, bringing nutrients to the plant. So I do believe in supplements, but they should be whole food supplements. So okay. if you cut a piece of broccoli and look at it under the microscope, you'll see little arms and legs sticking out. Some of those things, we don't even know what they are because we haven't discovered them yet. But the whole food together does the job because it synergistically works. That's right, yeah. And that's where, again, I, I, uh, I'm fascinated by the science spice and I'm very impressed as well. Um, but we have to, more, most of us, more, yeah, most of us have to find a way of achieving this where we don't have to study all of the, um, the, uh, the measurements and, the, and the, the, the Latin names and so forth. And I think that the simple um, movement towards let food be your medicine and using whole, using uh, a variety, I think it just covers a lot of ground. For exactly. Most people. And that's what you did in this book. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> what I love is it's well written. You have written it towards you're, you're speaking to your audience. You're not speaking down or trying to over speak. Um, I my book, whatever, whenever I write, I have a tendency to uh, get and my husband has to edit everything I write because he's like, <laughs> you know, they're not all scientists. And I'm like, oh, but this is such a good word. It's this big. And he goes, just cut it down. Yeah. Um, you have done that and it's comfortable and it's beautifully written. And it, then you get into the recipes. And I mean, that's it. <laughs> just read Thank the you. first part, then get into the recipes because you, oh. you will die to make all these recipes. Well, again, I, I've tried to, these are family favorites over 30 something years and raising our sons and having lots of friends around with me. Oh, you've eaten with us, haven't you? Oh, I've, yes. I've, I've just uh, tried to take the favorites. And a lot of those are derived from classics that everyone has had in some form or another, um, but they're made into plant-based form. And it doesn't mean that they're expensive to make, quite the opposite, because most families aren't built like that. We need right. to, 
Um, so they're very inexpensive. And they're not difficult. They're not difficult because uh, so I don't know about go, you, but I don't have time for this. I don't have time for anything, but you have to, <laughs> that's, the that's the point. You have to make time for it, but also you don't have that much time. So right. I've been, I've tried to include things that are very quick to make or that uh, there's another little section in it where I've said, uh, called it, let time do the work for you. Mm -hmm. There are certain things like um, soaking beans and making breads and uh, even some of the ferments. Um, you don't have to be there all the time. It's just working in the background. Exactly. All you do is set it up and life takes over. It does it for you. And exactly. you just have to appear on the scene now and again and make sure that the oven is on and things like that. So I've tried to build all of those um, tips, really, tricks and tips into the, the book, as yes. well as provide recipes that are that children will like that their, your teenager will like, that your husband will like, um, that your friends will like. You can invite people around and it looks normal. It doesn't look like some weird alien concoction. No, um, well, people love good tasting food. Yeah. I know every holiday I make a big giant vegan feast, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas, whatever. And of course my family loves it. They're used to it, but I get knocks on the door from various nice. neighbors, nice. friends of my son going, so, so Spice, did you make that cashew cheesecake? Did you make this? Nice. Can I yeah. it? And I, I see like, don't you have to go home and eat Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, but we wanted to eat here first and then we'll just, they, people love good tasting food. Yeah. Provided you're not having some kind of, uh, social freak out about, oh, don't call me a vegan. That's like you mentioned in the beginning. That's for those skinny, weird guys that wear a weird t-shirt. Yeah. I don't well, know where I, that came about. I think it's, I think it's virtually disappeared. Um, there is so much interest now in the plant-based diet and it has never been easier to achieve it to some degree um, because there's so many products out there and there's a social cultural consciousness about yes. about it yes, um, certainly true. certainly the environmental message is very powerful um, some studies recently even saying it is essential that the majority that the, there's a global shift towards a plant-based food system um, in order for us to meet the the sort of goals of 2030 and 2050 yes um, and it's certainly a, a diet that or a way of eating that is it creates equalities rather than inequalities. It uses the, the land in a better way in every sense. Um, it's it's all win, all good news as far as I'm concerned, as far as I, I try to read very, very widely on this subject. And uh, it seems just a very sensible uh, move. And I think a lot of people are aware of this increasing numbers of people, especially young people. And so I've tried to build in uh, guidance, for instance, to, to turn uh, a lump of meat that would be a normal feature on the plate, um, to, to slowly trim that away over time and to, as part of the 80-20 idea, to create to serve that meat, but in a, almost like a garnish form, a very, very small helping eventually that provides the interest, provides uh, whatever it is the person wants from the meat-based element, but that greatly reduces the quantity and reduces the effect of that on their health and helps in a general transition, not just a personal one, but in a general social transition into um, this is more normal than it yes, ever was. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if you go back in the history, we didn't have big gulp uh, yeah. mugs and we didn't yeah. have giant plates of meat. Um, there was no refrigerator or stove in a cave. Um, most of the people would get up and climb a tree, eat the fruit, survey the valleys, eat the grass, maybe insects, whatever. But um, as we... I read a book saying the worst thing that ever happened to mankind was cooking. So oh. <laughs> like just cooking are slabs you, of meat and things like that. Are but you a raw food? I'm here we go with the 80-20. I'm 80% raw, 20% cook. 
Okay. Because we always have a big giant bowl of every kind of vegetable that you could cut up in a salad, uh, mm -hmm. you name it. And my family knows they can open that bowl, grab a handful of salad, throw it in a bowl. Then we'll steam some Brussels sprouts, broccoli, uh, uh, asparagus, and then yeah. we'll have whatever protein we're going to have for that night. And um, a lot of we do is nuts, seeds, beans. Uh, we soak the beans 24 hours, drain yeah. them out. But I would say I'm 80, 20, 80% 80 raw because we eat fresh fruit in the morning with yeah. pre soaked walnuts and almonds and whatever we eat throughout the day. The only cooking that we really do is at nighttime, maybe with our, you know, Gardein and certain light life and certain products that we feel good on okay. GMO and stuff like that. Wow. I got to say, this sounds very Californian. <laughs> oh, <I don't> <laughs> okay. Here, here in London, here in London, it's just that it, like today, it's just, it's got this um, mist. It's almost a fog and we just need warmth. Oh, and, well, we had that yesterday, today. Yeah. yeah and I, I just, I'm a person, I, I need a bit of warmth and I yes. don't know how I could get that with, with so much raw food. I do enjoy some raw food. Um, it's, it's just a different metabolism, is it? Or, uh, or perhaps different climate? Well, I wrote a book and it talked, um, part of my book on uh, food combining was categorizing mini carbs, midi carbs and complex carbs. And the mini carbs were more of the ones that you could take, put in your fingers and smoosh together, lettuce, mm -hmm. certain things, tomatoes, certain things that just break down immediately, chewing and are absorbed yeah. within an hour to two. Then the more complex ones were the broccoli, the Brussels sprouts, um, you know, things that really needed to be slightly steamed then your teeth will do the rest. Then your complex carbs were more of the yams and the grains yes. and those kind of things. So I try and stay away from a lot of complex carbs because they don't, um, for every carbohydrate, you collect five uh, water molecules. And I have a tendency to blow up if I eat too many carbs. Okay. But I don't have that problem with yams. Yams are wonderful. They're loaded with vitamin A and fiber and everything, but in, but white potatoes are a little high glycemic. Yeah. So I yeah. do adjust, I adjust my diet and basically my family's diet based off that. Plus I go along with um, your parasympathetic um, uh, constitution for your autonomic nervous system is one is parasympathetic where you're rest and digest, the other is fight or flight, sympathetic. So I'm the fight or flight kind of a gal. Okay. My husband's a parasympathetic. So uh, he can eat more carbs and more heavier proteins than I can. So based off our constitution, I kind of break it up for myself. Nice. Wow. So I, I have a much simpler um, job here with, with, preparing food and it uh, I don't do any of that but that you just described <laughs> you're <laughs> still it, eating healthy you're I still... am yes and and my family as well um, we take a lot of care but I I haven't explored what you've just described yeah, but you just a... proved the point Peggy that you don't have to have the knowledge in my brain that yeah. I became addicted to over turning my life around and everything. You're talking about 40 something years of including the science behind it. You, through your personal experience and changing your diet, I mean, look at you, you're beautiful, Peter's healthy, your kids are gorgeous and strong. So your knowledge allowed you to cook and make these foods. Uh, in the, like we said, all paths leave lead to the yeah. correct goal. It was to be healthy and happy, eat good food. And basically when I'm cooking at night, I'm thinking, okay, what does my husband want? What does Luke want? Yeah. What, what do I want? I don't go into, oh, this is so many carbs and whatever. Good, uh, yeah. It, that, that's it goes a, that's away, a, all that goes Yeah, away. yeah. It's a lovely feeling, isn't it? To feel that connection with what you're gonna prepare. And that's what I, personally enjoy immensely is to uh, get a sense of the foods, partly by their color, partly by their flavor and, and the scent 
sometimes or the aroma they create when they're cooked um, as to what they're what they're doing for me and that connection is is really why I enjoy cooking so much mm -hmm. because um, it's 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 tactile but it's also it's sensory put it that right. way I totally and, agree yeah and I just it also takes away a lot of stress and tensions that you know accrue during the day and it's creative I really enjoy that so even though some of the recipes and in, I've included are very very short very quick to make um, they're immersive in that um, it's a, it's quick payback yes. through the colors and flavors and so yes, forth. It's like um, having an audience, <laughs> <They're> uh, <laughs> you know. But I, that's why what really disturbs me is I'll like I'll make a particular salad dressing with garlic and I grow the herbs and things like that, and then Gregory may put something on it and I go, "Whoa, what are you doing?" I made that salad dressing to taste that way. He goes, well, I like a little bit of, I don't put that ketchup there. Don't oh. And he's like, well, I like it that way. And I'm like, oh, but yeah. I'm yeah. cooking also through my sensory. Uh, yes. Like, yeah. oh, I know how this tastes. Oh, that's perfect. And he'll go yeah. put something on it. And I'm like, but. Yeah. One of the reasons that um, I've put an, uh, an emphasis on local providers of fresh food is not so much the environment actually, but um, for that that quality of freshness and flavors that you can derive from uh, or that you can sense in a fresh food. Yes. And I'm afraid that there are still shops that sell really old food and still calling it fresh. <laughs> and, wow. and I, yes, I That's think a it's problem. A, That's a big problem. Well. It, it needn't be, but it is. It's it's the way we've organized the foods, the global food system. And I think that if if possible, if if part of the 80-20 rule could be applied to how often we select foods that are locally grown. And there is no real definition of local, but we tend to have a sense of it. Um, but that that it's generally between I don't know, 70 and 100 miles from wherever you are, something that could be transported to you within a day is what I would say. And the, the quality is so noticeably different when you receive a food that's very fresh like that and that's grown that local to you. Um, it feels, you can almost feel the nutrient value. Yes. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Totally agree. And when I don't eat something, if I get broccoli and it's not organic, because sometimes at a, a restaurant, you can't get organic yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I'll, I'll look at Gregory and I just go, I can taste the chemicals in here. I yeah. can taste them. But you know, the thing is that when you clean out and you get really clean and specific with your diet, your taste buds start to really bloom. Yes. It's, it's quite a lovely thing. Actually, yes, yeah. it is. So I, I just got a message, I think, about uh, turning this over. OK. Did you get that message? Yes, I've just looked at it now. Okay. So <laughs> we have so, to relinquish, Peggy. OK, all right. It's not easy, but there you are. OK, Hi, there yeah. she Hi, is. Darling. Hello. Magna. I've been here. Um, what a great discussion. Um, I've been so excited about um, looking through some of the recipes in the book. Uh, we've got some questions from our attendees, if you'd like to answer them. Yes. Um, question from Catherine, um, can we see a table of contents and some pictures of the recipes? Are there any uh, specific recipes that you wanna show the audience or that you're really excited about that you think they should try? Well, all of them, but go ahead, mm -hmm. go ahead, Peggy. Well, at, at the moment, I'm really uh, having great fun making my own tempeh. Um, which is an Indonesian food, and it's um, it's a ferment. And what it does is it converts some of the proteins in beans, and occasionally other things are added, like nuts or grains. But um, it processes, it, it converts them so that they're much easier to digest. I just pulled this up. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. Uh, tempeh crisp with pomegranate glaze. Okay. That's, we both are on the same page. Yes, I've, I've also, I've included a couple others. One is berry marinated tempeh roast, and the other is a TLT, which is 
um, a BLT without the B. It's tempeh lettuce and tomato sandwich. Wow. And um, th there's a, a company here in Britain that uh, is, is based in Scotland yeah. and that, that provides the culture so that I can stir the culture into the, my, the bean selection and pack it together in a little parcel. And 24, 36 hours later, it's fermented and I've got tempeh. And wow. it's, so ex it's so exciting wow. for me. Yeah. Can I get that here in America? The culture, I, I wonder, I bet you could, but I could send you some if you like. Yeah, I just made my yogurt, my, yeah. my vegan yogurt. And um, I have a little vegan culture that I yes. use. And yes. within six hours, I had this amazing yogurt. So, yeah. um, but I've never seen culture for that. For that well, I think cultured foods are, or fermented or are, are very, very interesting for, I mean, that'll be another discussion, Spice, but it'll yeah, be. Yeah, I know, I know. Don't, for, no, for, for the, the enzymes time. and for, <laughs> just for the nutrient value of those foods and how, uh, for, for tempeh in particular, it's how easy it makes it to digest because some people have trouble with those heavier foods. Oh, that, they're loaded with enzymes. Yeah. And they really help the enzymic, um, you know, works of trying yeah. to break down foods sure. in the gut. And, you know, you have 30 feet of intestines and you, it's <laughs> got to take that journey through the peristalsis and you want that food breaking down to absorb those. Nutrients. So the enzymes, the ferment helps it get started. There you go. Okay. There, there go. Okay, Magna. Um, speaking of yogurt, um, Tina had a question about yogurt. She says, um, I love making yogurt at home. Is there a plant-based version? Could you talk a little bit more about plant-based yogurts? Well, Spice, can you do that? Yes, I can. Um, my, I have a, a, a soy maker. Um, I, my a, plant, a plant milk maker. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. it's called... It's called soya or something like that. It is a yogurt yeah. maker. Oh, okay. And, and um, I, uh, it's a container. It's really easy. I take two. I like the milk, uh, Eden soy. So you use soya milk? Yes. Okay. And, and uh, it's unsweetened, unflavored. And I put that in a pot. It, this uh, yogurt maker comes with a temperature, a therm uh, thermometer. thermometer. <laughs> so I'm having a senior moment, but a thermometer. So I just pour the two containers of the milk in there with a, a um, thermo thermometer. thermometer. I'm going, sorry, yeah. my mind took a left turn. But anyway, I bring it up to 180 degrees, then I let it cool off to about 80. And then I uh, put in two little packets of this vegan culture. Okay. And I will put in a little uh, uh, vanilla extract with a little bit, like a couple tablespoons of agave, because it does need a little bit of sugar. That's, to that's a syrup, itself. is it? Yes. Okay. The agave syrup from cactus. Okay. And it's very low glycemic. It's not honey. I, honey, I have a, a problem with because it cultivates. Honey is good for burns if it's really good, but when you consume it, it can breed. Uh, candida and fungus and things like that. So, but the agave, and then I put it in this machine for five hours and I open it up and I, yesterday I just made my yogurt. I, I pulled everybody in. My son's coming over. You made yogurt? I'm coming over. And nice. so amazingly good. Great. Sounds magical. <laughs> yes. Well, the machine does all the work, but uh, <laughs> check it out. I don't know where I got it, but do a Google search or a search and find a soy milk um, or, or, or a plant milk. I don't know how they, uh, a yogurt maker. It was probably just. Okay. But the culture itself, do, do you purchase that specially? I get that on Amazon too. I think it's called Bella. Bella okay. Bella. Huh? Bella. My husband's here. He's like, <laughs> it's called Bella. So, okay. Yeah. Bella plant-based culture. They're very inexpensive. Yeah, yeah. If I and, and the containers like this. So if I were to buy all that yogurt, it would be a pretty penny. And all it cost me was a couple cartons of milk. Nice. Nice. That's mm. pretty amazing. Yes. Mm. I'm gonna have to try that too. Oh I'm my god, it's so much fun. <laughs> I've been watching. Pop that lid and go, oh my god, I made yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. Magic. Um 
you know, we talked a little bit about this one already, but an anonymous, anonymous attendee asks, um, what is a favorite recipe from the contented vegan? Oh, well. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, asking what's your favorite child? You know? yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I love making soups and we're just coming to the end of, the, you know, the peak of the soup season here. Um, so I do have, I, I've got about a dozen different soup recipes in there. I love um, the pumpkin and parsnip soup and the, mm -hmm. the season for, for pumpkins is just finished a few days ago, I, in my opinion. Um, over the winter, leek and potato soup. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, it's, it's really set you up. Well, I have to admit that I'm incredibly addicted to artichokes. Uh -huh. And there is the spinach Oh, Artichoke yeah. Tart. I mean, nice. forget Amazing. about it. This would not last in my house more than five minutes. So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. And now for that, I, I, I made up a, a pastry recipe because um, it's very, it's sometimes very difficult to find a pastry that's uh, sold in the shops that, that doesn't have animal based products in it or that doesn't have palm oil in it. Yeah. And I, I just don't want to use too much of that. So I, I, it took me a couple of years actually, but I took, I did develop this um, short crust pastry recipe and I used that for that tart. So I'll be interested to see or hear from you, Spice, if you enjoy that. Oh no, I will be, <laughs> trust me, I will okay. be. Cause I, I mean, I must cook about, I don't know what you call it cooking, but I do prepare about six meals a day. I mean, we okay. have our fresh cut fruit with pre-soaked almonds, walnuts, whatever. And then we make a breakfast. Sometimes it's baked yams or some, my husband likes certain things. And then we have lunch and then we have a mid-afternoon snack. Then we have dinner. Then we have a snack. So I'm constantly, but like, yeah. but like you, Peggy, if I'm making beans for uh, tonight, you know, I already put them in the pot to soak yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have to pay attention, <laughs> maybe drain the water a couple times because yeah. the stachios, that's four bonded sugars, they break apart. You want that to happen in the pot, certainly not your stomach. But uh, <laughs> I guess throughout the week, whatever vegetables, whatever fruits, whatever we have, I'm always thinking ahead, just like if you have a business appointment. Uh, you knew that we were going to be on this call, right? Yes. So we prepared for it. Yeah. Same thing I feel about our food. It's a business. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a faith and a business. So yeah. I know what we're going to eat Friday. Yeah. I just okay. know that. So I prepare the fruit. I prepare everything we're going to have. And, um, and then it's just kind of already done, like you said. Yeah. It's nice. so easy because it's already done. Yes. I, I have a slightly different. I know we're going to eat the next day. So... <laughs> So I, I do something, I soak something or, or, or I don't, but then I see what's available and then I get creative Yeah. and I, I just respond often just on the moment. Although I have a sense, okay, I, I'm, I think I'll do beans of something. Um, I do have this sense of forward looking right. pre preparation, but it all just fits in. It's become um, almost w with, without any thought now to fit in these little tasks um, that, that make the meal preparation very smooth and very comfortable. Right, but you've created and developed your creativity because there's so many times I put a recipe together and I'm like, oh, I'm going to make this. I'm going to add this. I'm going to do that. And then I go to reach for it and it's not there. Ah, like, yeah. Oh, now what do I do? All right. Well, it's not chili. Now it's going to be curry. So yeah. <laughs> I have the ability to switch recipes nice. out and Gregory and Luke will say, I thought we were having chili. Nah, tonight we're having curry. It's India. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hmm. Um, on that note, there is another question from an anonymous attendee. Um, what was your process of writing the contented vegan? You know, maybe you can speak to some of that creativity or um, recipe development. Specifically to do with recipes, do you think? Have they asked that? Yep, it just says, what was the okay. process of writing the contented beacon? So um, how I, I guess, however you'd okay. like to answer that, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I did have a cache of several hundred, because I, I kept a notebook over the years, um, because I, I, 
I love to write and a lot of things went into the notebook, including, you know, stories about our family and so forth. Um, but also the recipes and a kind of the family review of them as well. Um, and I also wanted to, over the years, put it this, over the years, as people realized that I didn't eat animal-based products, I increasingly people would approach me and say, I'd like that. I'd like to try that. How do I get started? Or I'd like to try it, but I have this allergy. Or they, they would bring just problems. Or I'd like to try it, but I know my partner would not like to try it. And so it was a mixture of social problems uh, or issues and health issues and just curiosity. And I wanted to make it available to people, my experience of 30, 35 years um, and raising a family and going through the whole, all the pregnancy and the breastfeeding and the whole thing. I wanted to make that available in a way that was also attractive and it felt like an invitation and that made people realize it's actually quite simple and it's actually quite natural and fundamental to all of this. It's actually very, very personal. There is no rule to say how you must do this. There's no vegan police officer lurking in the background ready to that. pull you into the street if you're, if you're putting something this, in your mouth that shouldn't scarlet be Scarlet letter V. <laughs> yes. It's, it's entirely your call and to take the pressure off people to say, please do explore this. In fact, explore your food and try and rebuild the connection that all of us should have with our food because food is a life form. You know, whatever level we choose, um, you're, you're, you're eating another life form. And to me, that, that inspires great respect at least. Yes, and I agree. That we should, we should understand what we're doing. We should think about it deeply. We should appreciate it. And most of all, we should enjoy it. Yes. And so that was, that was what pulled it together for me. And then I simply put myself back in my earlier life and said, what would I want? Would it, what would I have appreciated from someone else when I was just beginning my journey? into a vegan lifestyle. Exactly. And I'll tell you why I appreciate this book so much. Many of my people that come to me and because I've lectured at a lot of vegan festivals or people know I'm a vegan and they don't believe it because I have muscles and I lift and I train and they're like, you can't possibly be a vegan. Oh yeah, I am. Well, how do I get started? And I've always said, well, uh, I don't know. I've never really found a good vegan book and the, the recipes are too complicated sometimes because you got to have, you know, a half a cup of this and this and a little eye of newt. I mean, it's just too complicated. So I'll always say, well, find a vegan restaurant in your area. Go pick some meals that you like and see if you can come home and duplicate them in, in a vegan way. And so that's kind of been my go-to. But now I can very easily go get the contented vegan. <laughs> And go Thank through you. all these recipes. It's right up your alley. And Thank you, Spice. Uh, you no, know, I'm I'm I've been doctoring people for 35 years, and um, you know it's very difficult to tell someone how to eat. You can tell them very easily how to take drugs. You can tell them very easily, you know, what you need for the next this, the next that, and. Um, even when I teach martial arts, I can teach them how to hit, punch, kick, take someone down. I teach, it's teaching other people what you know is a lovely, uh, just a great, beautiful ability because you're giving information to people. But to teach people how to eat is uh, difficult mm. because you're <laughs> dealing with like you said, social issues, you're dealing with very personal stuff. You're yeah. dealing with people that comfort eat. Like, how could I possibly eat this beautiful vegan meal when there's donuts over here <laughs> that are calling to me because I'm depressed today. And it really requires a love for yourself. 
and an open of your heart to say, I love myself. I want to be healthy. And, and, and the food that I take into my body, as Peggy's, she's very spiritual about this, the food, when it comes into your body, you're consuming this, li it's live food. It's not dead. When you cook a leg of lamb or something, that's dead. But when you take in this live food, you're taking in the life that is going to help propel your life. So it, it becomes a very spiritual journey, uh, but that's very difficult to teach someone in um, a few minutes. So they have to experience it. Yeah. Hmm. Nice. I love that focus on mindful consumption now. Uh, yes. Yeah. The, the really taking the time um, to think about what it is that you're eating very simply. Yes. Well, yes. that's asking somebody to think, but that's why I, which is a hard thing, <laughs> but that's why I always say, um, learn to use your food rather than abuse it. Hmm. And people yeah, abuse cool. their food so badly. They don't know. They just shove it in their mouth. They're drinking. They're not really chewing. They're, they just grab whatever, you know, when people say, you want to go out for Mexican food? I'll go, Oh yeah, okay. Well, I'll probably get a, um, a a salad with some guacamole and some beans and some maybe some tortilla chip, whatever. I already know how I'm going to eat, but I think in terms of is it my protein meal? Is it my carb meal? I I start thinking in terms rather than oh yeah, we're going out for Mexican, Indian, whatever like that. In my mind, I'm thinking, what does my body need right now? Do I need to go out for ice cream? I don't think so. So mm -hmm. I, I try and use my food per my body and what I need. As, mm -hmm. as Peggy said, and that was a famous thing, you let your medicine be your, your let food, food be your medicine. Let your food, I'm dyslexic, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> but let your medicine be your food. And that's the way we got to think about, yes. I mean, it's okay. It really is okay to think in these terms. It's not, we're not weirdos. We're just people that want to live healthy and longer and be around for our families and mm -hmm. uh, make those preventative choices. That's it. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a beautiful way to wrap it up today. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you both so much for joining us and for joining our, our audience and sharing your wisdom, um, sharing your thoughts on the consent of vegan. Uh, um, the book is available on our website at booklarder.com if you'd like to buy a copy. And we also have signed book plate versions. Thank you, Peggy, so much for sending us. Some oh, I, think, I think she signed mine too. And uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank the people that joined us. Um, know that we're all spiritually connected. And so the fact that you joined to listen to us is a great gift. So thank mm. you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you both. Thank you. And again, thank you for everyone who's listening. I really appreciate it. Take care. Um, well, be safe uh, and happy cooking. Thank you so much. Have a good day and um, happy, happy eating. <laughs> happy, happy. Okay. Take care. Happy. Thanks, Meg. Happy, happy eating. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Take Bye. Care. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm.